What's up? It's Marvin of the Miles Ahead Podcast. For today's episode, it will be based on the NBA pertaining to a review of the conference finals and a preview for the finals. It will also be a collaboration episode with Mike from Mike in New Haven Podcast on MC's Apostrophe S Audio on YouTube. So check it out and... Uh, if Mike has anything to say or give us intro, then let's get into that too. All right. Thank you, Marvin. And on that note, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Mike in New Haven podcast, episode 81. Yes, I have returned from hiatus. For my listeners, you know that I took the majority of June off. I recorded a couple of interviews in the early goings of June, but after that, I took the rest of the month off to enjoy the beautiful summer weather and work on some other projects uh, that I wanted to get to. I have those coming up soon. I'm very excited about them. And you'll be seeing them soon. But I am back now uh, for what is going to be a very busy rest of the summer. And we're going to kick it off with my next guest who has been on this show before. We did a preview of the NBA season together. We did a preview of the Super Bowl together. He's a regular. My buddy, Marvin McIntyre, as you just heard, is back on the show for another crossover edition between the Miles Ahead podcast and the Mike the New Haven podcast. So, Marvin, good to have you back. Good to be back. And let's get into the episode. So first, we're going to dive into the conference finals with the West between the Clippers versus the Suns. Let's give our reactions. Uh, Mike, what did you think about it? I thought, you know, I was mentioning this to you off the air. Uh, As somebody that's been a fan of Kawhi Leonard's game for a long time, I remember the kind of bittersweet feeling I had when he was injured in 2017 Western Conference Finals against the Golden State Warriors, because I would have loved to have seen, Grand the Warriors had a great team, so they probably would have won anyway but I would have loved to have seen what that conference finals would have been like had Kawhi been healthy facing that Warriors team um, that wound up sweeping the Spurs once Kawhi went down. And so it's kind of a similar feeling here. I think the Suns probably would have won anyway. Uh, They had the better team, but it would have been interesting to see what it would have been like had Kawhi been able to play this series. Um, I think it probably would have gone seven, went six anyway without him. So who's say it wouldn't have gone seven. Um, but nonetheless, it, it takes nothing away from Phoenix, just like it takes nothing away from Golden State in 2017. Phoenix was the better team. I think they did what they had to do. And, and more impressively, they went on the road in a hostile environment. And uh, after losing game five at home, they could have been rattled. They could have been thrown off course. They held together. And not only did they win, they, they won going away. It blew them out. Yeah, I thought it was a very good uh, series, very entertaining. I also felt like, uh, you know, had Kawhi Leonard had been there, I felt like the the Suns would have lost that series. But, um, you know, that's just the NBA in general. And, uh, you know, you really can't get too mad about it. I think that Paul George definitely did show that, um, show that he's much more of a playoff performer now. I feel like he's gotten a lot better, and uh, which is good for him and his reputation. And uh, I also believe that, Chris Paul, he redeemed himself a little bit. Uh, he came he came back and, uh, you know, they were kind of in trouble a little bit in, in the fourth quarter of uh, game six. And they were and he was able to close the deal this time. And, uh, you know, we're just going to have to see where where that, um, you know, brings Phoenix. Brings the Phoenix Suns uh, later on in the finals. So but I'm definitely uh happy for the Suns in general, but, uh, you know, we just got to see what happens, you know. For sure. Uh, For sure. I mean, I'm happy for both squads. I mean, we'll talk about the Bucks a little bit later, but obviously the Phoenix Suns, not since 1993, have they been to the NBA Finals. Of course, that's when Michael Jordan completed his first three-peat, courtesy of that John Paxson game-winning shot in game six. They've had a lot of great teams over the years that have come close. Uh, Certainly those Steve Nash teams of the mid-2000s come to mind that made a couple of conference finals. Uh, but this is the first time they've made the finals is that great Charles Barkley, Kevin Johnson team of 92, 93. And so it's good. It's good for the, it's not only good for Phoenix, but it's good for the NBA. Right. Uh, it's, I think it's just good for small markets in general. Right. Yeah. You know, so uh, I feel like this is a win for the small market team. So. You know. Oh, for sure. This, this is a fine. Well, I'll call it right now. This is a finals for the underdog. If you are somebody that roots for the underdog, this is the NBA finals for you. Exactly. Now let's get into some of the questions. So, did Paul George revive his career in terms of his playoff, in terms of his uh, playoff run blunders? 
I listen, I can't really, I know it's fun to slander Paul George. I mean, anybody that is listening to this that knows Marvin and I well, you know, off the air, um, will remember, especially if you went to school with us, it was one of our favorite pastimes to go in the library the day after a playoff game during those spring semesters and laugh our butts off as we slandered Paul George. Um, you know, it's, it's just the thing to do in the last few years, ever since Carmelo Anthony uh, christened him as playoff uh, P, which he is not, of course, or has not been in previous times. But I mean, in this uh, playoff run, I really can't fault him. I mean, Kawhi Leonard got hurt and Kawhi Leonard got hurt in the second round against a Utah Jazz team that had the best defense in the league and was the number one seed in the Western Conference and had, I believe, the best record in the league at 52 and 20 in the short and 72 game season. Paul George carried the Clippers. I mean, Terrence Mann had a great game six. Yes, but Paul George, when the series was tied up at two games apiece, after the Clippers had previously been down two games to none, one game five on the road, helped them rally back from a 25-point deficit in game six, got into a conference finals. Yeah, he missed some key free throws, some crucial free throws in game two, but nonetheless, uh, got him some big victories in games three and five. I think, listen, with the guy that's clearly the second best player on the team, he took him about as far as they could go. And they lost to the better team. I don't think there's any shame in that. And I don't think Paul George has anything to be ashamed of. If anything, had he pushed it to a game seven, he would have completely eliminated the slander. There's still going to be some because that's just, I mean, that's just the way it is. But I don't think that he's really deserving of a large degree of it because he showed up when he had to. I feel like he had a very good redemption tour. I mean, like everybody's going to have, you know, some bad games here and there, but he did kind of revive himself a little bit. And especially from last year where he would put his foot in his mouth and, and a year before that, you know, he just does a, a lot. So I feel like this definitely did help him. And I do think that people will view him differently, which is good. Um, but if we're expecting anything else from him, I think that he just solidified himself as a Hall of Famer, but not necessarily a superstar caliber player. You know, I don't think he's a superstar, but I do think he could carry a team to a game or or two. You know, I do I do think that they were missing more than just Paul George. Uh, I mean, um, I do think that the, I do think, I believe that the Clippers were missing more than just Kawhi Leonard. I think they were missing um, Zubak. They were missing uh, Serge Ibaka. Right. So, you know, they were just missing quite a few players. So I do think that if Serge Ibaka was there or or even Kawhi Leonard, you know, I do think that those players would have definitely made a difference within the series. But it just didn't happen. So. Right. But uh, as far as uh, Paul George, he played great uh, for his time being there. And, uh, you know, he should be commended for his uh, hustle and drive. And, you know, he just didn't have it for for game six, he didn't have his, his legs under him. And, you know, he, he played the most minutes throughout the whole playoff. So, you know, he tried. Yeah, I think fatigue is definitely a factor. I mean, listen, you play 72 games. Uh, you're banged up. Everybody's banged up come playoff time. Then you have to add in those those playoff games, which are, are extra grueling on top of the season that you already had. I mean, he yeah, adds 10 games less than the norm, but it's still no walk in the park. It's still no day at the beach to play that many games. And then if you're a playoff team, play even more. It's a war. And Paul George, again, as I said earlier, he took it. Not only did it take the Clippers as far as it go, he took his own body as far as it could go. This is a man that's battled some pretty severe injuries in his past. And so we have to take that into account, too. Um, I, you know, I, I, I salute him. I commend him. I think he did a great job. And of course, uh, next year, if the Clippers are healthy and he continues to play the way that he did this playoff run, who's to say that they won't go further? Well, you know, time will tell. Okay. All right. Well, next question. Um, was it fatigue or was it, uh, was it fatigue or did Paul George choke in this series? Well, as I kind of just touched on fatigue, 70, 72 games, um, you know, I'm trying to think of the Clippers went seven with the Mavericks. So that's 79 games that they I'm counting the playoffs. Now they went six with the doing the math off the top of my head. They, they went six with the Jazz. So that's 85 games. And then they went six with the uh, Phoenix Suns. So that's he played 91 games. I don't know how many games he played during the regular season, but he played probably the majority of those games. I don't I don't know how much time he missed. Uh, I'd have to check it here and, and see his game log, but nonetheless, 
uh, 91 games, playing a majority of those is going to take something out of you. It's, it's just, it's a fact. It doesn't matter how great a shape you may be. And he played in 54 games this year. So of the 91 games that the Clippers played, he played in a combined, he played in, well, 73 of those games. It's a lot. It's going to take its toll on you. Um, and again, counting his injury history, particularly that gruesome injury he suffered with his leg uh, during a FIBA tournament, I believe, uh, a number of years ago, uh, I would have to chalk it up to that. Everybody's running on fumes by this point in the year, and that's in any sport in the postseason. Anybody in baseball, football, hockey will tell you the same thing. You're running on fumes, you're running on adrenaline, and you're running on instinct. And that's that's what Paul George did. So I, I wouldn't say he joked. It's not like the Clippers were better than the Suns. If they were, then I would say, yeah, he, he did. But And he spit the bib again. But the Suns had the better squad, and, and I really can't say that it was anything to do with, with uh, the choking of his past as much as it is just the body having had enough. Uh, yeah, I, I, would agree for, I, would, I would agree with that for the most part. I do think that in game six, he could have did a lot better with not turn the ball over. Um, I do think that that does kind of mess up the team. But I would chalk it up to fatigue as well. So let's move on. Did Tyron Lue prove, prove he is a top five coach? Yeah, because remember, they were down two, two games to none uh, and three games to two as well at one point in their first round against the Mavericks. They were down two games to none, though. All three rounds they played, they lost the first game, two games at home against uh, Dallas. And then notice he didn't panic. And if you recall, and obviously this gets the more focus is on LeBron and Kyrie to an extent too, but also LeBron James for their comeback in in 2016 when he was coaching Cleveland to win that championship. But if you notice when they went down three, one, he wasn't, he was, he was very calm. He wasn't defeated. He still had a lot of confidence. And he basically told his guys, I mean, I remember it was a press conference where a reporter asked him, basically, I'm paraphrasing, is it over? And Tyron Lue said out loud in that press conference, if anybody here, meaning the guys on his squad, anybody here thinks it's over, don't come on the plane, don't hop on the plane. And of course, they won three straight. And was it directly because of that quote? No, obviously, other factors, uh, well-known factors played a part. But the point is, he kept his cool. And he never lost faith. He never wavered. He never panicked. Same thing this playoff run. He never panicked when they went down two games. No, what did they do? They went on the road and, and not only won, they won going away. They won decisively on the road in Dallas. They lost game five at home. Did he panic? No. They went on the road and won a hard fought game six and came back home and won game seven. When they went down two nothing to the Jazz, again, not no panic. Same thing with the Suns. Tyron Lou, I have to eat some crow here, admittedly, because I always thought that the only reason that he was a coach with a winning record and a coach that had been to a few NBA finals and whatnot and had won a championship was because he was coaching a team with so much talent up at the top of the food chain of that talent being LeBron James and Kyrie Irving. And yes, the Clippers have a wealth of talent too and Kawhi and Paul George and Morris and two bucks and Ibaka. And yes, it's a very good squad, but nonetheless, he's dealt with a lot of adversity that he didn't have to deal with that much in Cleveland and so to have to mitigate all that and still get to game six of a conference final. Um, yeah, I think, he, I think he definitely elevated his standing and he proved, hey, it's, it, my success as a coach is not due to necessarily having elite players as much as it is my natural abilities. And I, and I commend him for that because, hey, he proved me wrong. And he proved a lot of other people wrong too. Yeah, I never really thought that he was really a bad coach. I always thought that he was elite. Um, even even in the Cleveland series, uh, you know, he actually told told the um, told LeBron and Kyrie that um, that this is going to be a physical series, I believe. And I'm paraphrasing, but you know, he definitely did get them in shape for the mentality to come back three one. So if it was not for him, you know, in terms of you know him trying to tell them not to play soft. Um, they probably might have lost that series because you know they were they were up three um, they were down three one, and you know sometimes it does take a coach making that speech or that type of adjustment in in everybody's minds or whatever to to want to come back. So I do think that Ty Lue, he definitely played a huge part of it. 
me, I think that he told LeBron that you're playing soft and, you know, and the thing is that the Cavs, they had more talent. They just played up to their talent that year. As for the, um, as for the Clippers, yeah, he did his thing. He definitely did do his thing. Um, I believe that he definitely did show that he's a far better coach than Doc Rivers. Um, Doc Rivers, he had never got over to the conference finals as a Clipper, as a Clipper coach. And Tyron Lue does it in his first year with injuries to his, to his whole entire squad. That should be, uh, that's not good for Doc Rivers. And that doesn't look good for the, um, uh, for the Sixers organization that they have a coach like that. But I digress. Let's get into, uh, Ty Lue. Ty Lue, he made very good, very good adjustments. Uh, he, um, he did everything possible to keep them good with their mentality and not to give up. And that's what uh, caused them for them to come back to world twice. Uh, a lot of people thought it was over. I thought it was over um, when they lost to, um, I want to say, a couple games at home against the, against the Mavericks, when they had lost against the Mavericks a couple times. And, uh, you know, they were up 2-0, and, you know, they just came back and they stopped Luka. They did it. And um, and then the next series against the Utah Jazz, they did their thing again. And, um, you know, they were able to shut down Donovan Mitchell and uh, Mike Conley, and they just continued to, to work hard. And um, tell you the truth, they, they actually were very close to winning this series if it wasn't for you know, some free throws and um, and a couple other things um, going down. Um, they were very close. So, you know, I I commend uh, Tyloo very heavily, and I definitely think he's a top five coach in this league. Yeah. Um, let's, let's move on. Does Kawhi Leonard play another season with the Clippers? Yeah, I don't think there's a reason for him to leave. I mean, he's from California. He's uh, located. He has a really nice arrangement with the Clippers that they they accommodate him heavily. Um, I mean, understandably, he's a two-time Finals MVP. He's earned that kind of special treatment. He lives out in San Diego. He really has a really good setup there. And on top of that, it's a good squad. I mean, obviously, if it wasn't a good squad, he was wasting his time with a team that was either a bad team or on, it was just a team that was only going to get to the first round and get knocked right out then yeah, I would entertain the idea that maybe he leaves, but I don't see a reason. They're coming off a conference finals appearance. They were able to get to a game six of the conference finals, two wins away from the NBA finals without them. Obviously, I think, as you mentioned earlier, a lot of people would say, not just Clippers fans, that maybe if he was there, the series turns out differently. I think Kawhi Leonard obviously would be, believe that if you were to ask him uh, and give him some truth serum for him to tell you. So I, I see him coming back. Maybe I think what he might do, if anything, is probably do what LeBron did a, a number of years ago when LeBron had a, a he had certain LeBron always had very short term deals in his second time around with the Cavs. So LeBron would opt out, but then sign right back for more money. I think he would do that. He opts out, but everybody knows he's not leaving and he'll just sign right back and, and work something out. I, I don't think I'd be very surprised if Kawhi Leonard was playing elsewhere next season. I don't think he will. Yeah, I would agree. I don't think anybody can really swindle him. I think that he's going to be able to play with the Clippers, and and uh, I do think that he's in it for the long haul. I believe that. Uh, I, I feel like this this get, this series or whatever it just says job is not done. So he's going to try and complete. He's going to try and complete um, next year. He might even do a one year contract. I can see that happening. Mm-hmm. And then, then he might then he might try to go to a different team, but if they don't win it next year, then I can definitely see him moving on. But definitely a one year contract for sure, at least. Um, here's the next one: Can the Clippers get to the finals in the next few years? I know it's easy to say yes right now because, as the old saying goes, hindsight's twenty twenty, and 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 also revisionist history is a beautiful thing. But I really do think that there's a good chance they can. I mean, I'm not just saying that because of the run they just had. I, I hate to sound like a broken record, but you, you, if you're able to come within two wins of your first finals appearance ever without your best player, and that says something. And obviously there's free agency. Maybe you don't keep guys, maybe certain guys that were valuable to this run leave. And that certainly uh, hurts. And that takes something, takes a chunk out of your armor, so to speak. 
But uh, there's no reason to believe that as long as guys stay healthy and produce at a top tier level, they that they won't be in the finals. I think they've been knocking on the door for a while now. And this goes back, ironically, to when Chris Paul got to the Clippers um, back in 2011, 2012. That was when the window opened up and they slowly but surely been shopping away at this door for years now. And all the playoff failures were CP3. And then Kawhi and Paul George and the failures in that front last year, blowing a 3-1 lead. And now finally in the conference finals for the first time, they are so, so, so close to finally breaking down that door completely and getting to that finals that as long as this team does not implode in terms of guys, like I said, major players leaving um, and guys don't go down with horrible injuries, which you never want to see, obviously. Um, I think that there's a very good shot. I think the conference is wide open. I mean, who would have thought the Phoenix Suns were going to be in the NBA final? So if the, if the conference is wide open enough for Phoenix to make the playoffs and not have the kind of outstanding year they've had, why can't the Clippers? I don't think it's necessarily wide open because of all of the injuries. It's just the West. Let's not forget that. Um, no, it is the West, yeah. But I, I still think even with healthy guys, like say the Nuggets are healthy next year, obviously the Clippers will get healthy again. Once everybody's at full strength and, and guys get back from their ailments, and especially the guy I think of is Jamal Murray, the poor man who tore his ACL, um, I, I still think that even, even in a healthy Western Conference, they have a legitimate shot, again, as long as this core is kept together. Yeah, of course. I believe that they, I believe that they definitely have a legitimate shot. Uh, as a matter of fact, I probably would put um, Clippers Warriors uh, conference finals next year. And that's that's what I would have it. So mm-hmm. I, oh, yeah, yeah. there's a lot of uh, teams, a lot of tough teams uh, in the Western Conference, like the Utah Jazz, and you know they're knocking on the door, and you know, but. I did say the next few years, so that all depends on how long that Kawhi Leonard decides to stay. So I see what you did there, though, before we continue, because for those of you a little inside baseball for my listeners, Marvin's a big Golden State Warriors fan, big Golden State Warriors fan. I saw you slip the Warriors in there, so you know, don't think you're slick. And they could, listen, if they're healthy and they add a few guys, they could. But uh, I, I saw what you did there. You know, you think you're slick slipping your Warriors in there. I see you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's get into the next question. So, did Reggie Jackson prove that he's a legit playoff performer? Yes, and he honors his namesake because for those listening uh, that, are, that are baseball fans, you'll know the other Reggie Jackson was a legendary playoff performer for the Yankees and uh, had many clutch moments, and most notably hitting three home runs in game six of the 1977 World Series to clinch that uh, series uh, for the Yankees against the Dodgers. Um, so much like that Reggie Jackson, the basketball Reggie Jackson uh, lived up to his namesake as a good, and had a very good playoff of his own. And uh, listen, sometimes it looks can be deceiving because when a guy is chasing the bag, as Reggie Jackson will be this summer, the natural motivation and the, the ability to play at a high level just shoots right up. I mean, guys in contract years usually just have the best like career years, you know, the best seasons of their career. Um, in contract years. So it could be a little bit of that because we've seen once guys get the bag, they're, even if they don't outwardly say it, sometimes you, you can see it in their body language. Okay, I got my money. You know, I'm chilling and that's it. So I don't know if he's, if he did this because he was playing for a contract, maybe that's part of it. Um, but did he prove himself? I mean, listen, it's hard to say that he didn't. It's hard to say this is a fluke. I mean, He's had his moments before. He's hit some big shots before when he was with OKC a few times. But he did this consistently. And he was, again, much like Paul George. Is he the kind of player that Paul George is? No. But he, much like Paul George in the terms of the situation, Reggie Jackson proved that he was up to the occasion of having to carry a load he normally wouldn't carry with the best player in Kawhi being out um, and proved himself. And I think even in the Sun series, when the game six was close for a while, Reggie was hitting big shots. Game five on the road, Reggie hit a lot of big shots uh, to, to stave off elimination against Phoenix that time. So I, I can't say he didn't, you know, as far as what his motivations are, that part we don't know. But we certainly can't take away what he did. I think it's more so right place, right time, you yeah, know, right like, moment. Yes. And I also believe that, you know, because of, him having Rondo on the team, I definitely do think that that 
help them become a better point guard. So I believe that I believe that this this is a good a good um, playoff run for him. He could definitely uh, look back on it and definitely uh, you know think about the experience that he had, and he could definitely push forward. And I just think that uh, I think that he's only going to get better. So I mean, he's still kind of young, and you know we'll just see. But I definitely do think that he did turn himself into a legit playoff performer. But the thing is, is that he does have to do more things off the ball instead of, uh, you know, doing so much ISO, even though that he is scoring. Right. So next question. Did Chris Paul solidify himself as a top five point guard of all time for just getting to one finals? <laughs> or is the media just bugging? <laughs> the way you frame that question. Yeah. <laughs> I saw what you did there. I, you do exactly what you were doing when you put that question together, because again, a little inside baseball uh, for Marvin and I, we, we have a lot of conversations about just about a lot of things off the air as friends, but uh, especially about sports, uh, you know, and, and Marvin is not a Chris Paul fan at all. And I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and say I'm a Chris Paul fan either. I don't dislike the guy, but I've never been uh, drinking the, uh, the Kool-Aid with him, so to speak, as much as other people have. And on, if we're talking ability alone, I'm not going to say Chris Paul is top five because, I mean, a lot of people's lists will be different. If we're talking ability alone, though, he is among the best, certainly, to ever play the position. I wouldn't say that he isn't. But as far as declaring him, I mean, I know he's been called a point god, which is kind of, uh, you know, and, and uh, of course, his playoff failures are well documented. And, and Egregious. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Egregious, yes. Um, listen. When I again, this is this is such a we've had this conversation before off the air, and we're bringing it on the air now. This is such this is one of the most complicated legacies of any sport that you and I have ever examined. You know, I don't think there's a legacy more, you know, so difficult to properly put into context, at least for us, um, than it is with Mr. Paul. Because if you look at his career, yes, wherever he's gone. Say what you will about his shortcomings in postseason time, at least until this year. Wherever he's gone, he's made teams better. New Orleans was trash before he got there. He made them better, even though they didn't do much in the playoffs. Obviously, being a playoff team is better than being a lottery team. The Clippers, one of the worst franchises in sports, he made them better. Yes, they did not get the job done. They did not live up to expectations. But again, being a playoff team and a consistent one at that, is a heck of a lot better than being a lottery team. The Rockets, they were a second round team with, without Chris Paul. They became a conference finals team with Chris Paul. Oklahoma City Thunder were not viewed as a playoff team. A 0.5% chance of making the playoffs at the start of the 2019-20 season gets them to game seven of the first round against a superior Houston team. Phoenix, nobody really knew what they were going to be doing. People thought they would be good but I don't think anybody would have said they would have made the NBA finals. So the point being, he makes teams better. But at the same time, we, we live in a very what have you done for me lately society. To, and it's just not just sports, it's anything. It's a bad attitude to have, but a lot of people have it. And so people, you know, you could do whatever you can do in the regular season, but people are always going to judge you by what you do in the postseason. It's just how it is. It's just how fickle sports fans can be. And so that being said, um, I, don't, I don't know. He has to win. Is a, it's just a long way of saying he has to win. He the fact that he got the Phoenix Suns to the finals elevates him enough. I, I think to say that it wouldn't would be being a hater, not being objective. But if he doesn't win the championship, then he's not top five to me. He has to win a title against the Bucks, which they have a very good shot to do because they have home court. Um, in order for me to declare him a top five point guard of all time, or even at least put him in the conversation. And that with that being said. I will turn it over to noted Chris Paul hater, Marvin McIntyre, because I know you're dying to get it on this. So go ahead. I'm not a Chris Paul hater. I know. I'm, I'm a Chris to... Paul. I'm objective. Right. Okay. You're a realist. That's all. I'm, I'm just objective. A I'm a realist. And um, I just think that Chris Paul, I definitely believe that he is a top five talent, point guard of all time. You cannot deny that. Possibly even top three yeah. as a talent. But playoffs is where you make your legacy. And to tell you the truth, 
his legacy has not shown, I mean, up until this point, because of it being an injury-riddled season, that, um, that, that, that he is the top high point guard of all time. I mean, he has all the stats in the regular season. But playoffs, it's different. Now, again, he definitely he has to win, okay? But even if he wins, I still have Jason Kidd over him. Jason Kidd has a ring. Jason Kidd, he's led uh, two teams to back-to-back finals. Um, the only person who, who, who he would be above to me is Steve Nash. You know, Steve Nash, he's, he's in my top 10, but top 10 or 11. But, you know, um, but the thing is, is that, you know, if, if he passes, if he gets a ring, I'll put him over Steve Nash. But that's about it. You know, but as I just think that Chris Paul, you know, he has a lot of playoff blunders. I mean, uh, I mean, everybody wants to talk about, you know, the, um, the OKC run that he had uh, where he led that team from a, uh, from whatever from whatever percentage chance of not making the playoffs to um to, to making the playoffs. They had legit NBA players on that team. They had legit NBA players on that team. And in twenty nineteen, yeah. the war the um in twenty nineteen the Warriors they um they lost K D and I believe that they I I believe that uh I believe Steph got hurt as well within that series. I think he hurt his ankle or something like that. Yeah, he's always but, uh, but, Right, right. But the thing is, is that they were up. No, no, they were not even up. I'm trying to remember what happened. But, but, but the thing is, is that uh, Steph he, he came he came up and get, came up big in Game Five, uh, where Chris Paul and James Harden were supposed to shut that down and win that game. And then at the end, game six, Steph had zero, and then he had 33 in the second half. That's not supposed to happen. If Chris Paul is the point guard, why didn't he show up? You know, yeah. point, I mean, like, yeah. I mean, like point, point guard or whatever, that's like something, that's something that Magic Johnson, uh, Isaiah Thomas, or Stephen Curry, they should all have that. Um, I mean, they should all be in contestant for that. Obviously, Magic Johnson, he's the top level. But um, but I'm just saying is that you know, um, that that's that sounds like somebody who shows up in the playoffs, somebody yeah. who's a point guard. You know what I'm saying? You know, you and, know what uh, I think hurts. And then on top of that, you know, he. Uh, I, I don't mean What's to up? cut you. I don't mean to cut you off. I just well, uh, I'll say this briefly, and then I'll let you get back to what you're saying. I think what hurts him more than anything is not even his Houston failures because they lost to the better team in the Warriors so many times, and not his New Orleans failures because oftentimes with the Hornets were going up against teams way better than them, like San Antonio, LA, teams like that. What hurts him is the Clippers' failures because they were the better team more times off. Than not they were up 2-0 on OKC, they blew that lead in the series. They were up 3-1 on Houston, they blew that lead in the series. They were up 2-0 on Portland. And, yeah, I know Blake Griffin got hurt, and he got hurt in that series, too. But still, they lost that series. So, I mean, that's what hurts his legacy or has hurt his legacy at this point more than anything. But I didn't mean to cut you off, so I'll let you get back to what you're saying. They were also up um, 2-0 on the Grizzlies. Yep, that too, 2012. So, I'm, I'm just saying is that, you know, it's too many playoff blunders. He has to win this year. And uh, if he wins, he'll he'll just only crack the top ten. That's it. So uh, uh, as far as anybody making him top five or the point guard, it's it's crazy. He would have to do this a, f- a few more years, you know, in the postseason at least. So it's cool. Okay, so, go ahead. Yeah, just one last note on CP three. If we're ranking them, I guess Magic's one. Uh, it, it let's let's say for argument's sake that we would be putting CP3 in the top five. I mean, we know who number one is. Two through four, though, with CP3 being five, who was who's two through four? I mean, I guess Isaiah Thomas is in that conversation. Um, Isaiah, Isaiah Thomas is way was a way better player than uh Chris Paul. Way yeah, better. So. I think Zeke would have to be, yeah Zeke would have to be number two. I don't even. I don't even know. I, I personally, I think Chris Paul and Jason Kidd are pretty much the same player, except Chris Paul has better offense. Whoa, whoa, you're bugging out. You're well, bugging. because you're I have bugging. to say, I have to say, think about it. Let's, let, we, I, we'll try not to spend too much time. Because we still got to get to the, 
Okay. We, we still got to get to the Bucks and the Hawks in, in, in the finals. So it's the last thing I'll say. Right, yeah. Yep. Jason, every team, much like I said earlier, Chris Paul making every team he's gone to better, Jason Kidd did that with every team he went to because New Jersey was trash before he got there. Phoenix was a decent team, but they were a first round and out playoff team. Jason Kidd at least won them a playoff series. Uh, when, and when he was in Phoenix, New Jersey trash. First year he gets there, NBA Finals, back to back seasons in the NBA Finals. First season he's there, they went 52 games and they were a perennial playoff contender. Dallas was kind of a first round and out team, makes them a championship team. Even the Knicks, Melo never, even Melo for all that he did in Denver, Melo never played better in New York than the one year that he had with Jason Kidd. So as far as impact on teams, they're the same player. But as far as, I mean, I know Jason has the ring. And of course, yeah, he has that over Chris Paul right now. And I give him that. But as far as uh, offensive ability, I mean, the passing, they're the same. Great passers, both of them. The only thing that separates them is that Chris Paul has a better J than Jason did. Because, you know, the old joke about Jason Kidd, I said on the show before, Reggie Miller said it one time. Yeah, yeah. To, yeah we used to call him Ace and Kidd because he had no J. So, I mean, that, that's, the, that's the one thing with that comparison you made earlier that I would kind of disagree with to me, they're the same except on talent level, not resume, but talent level that they're kind of the same with the slight edge to Chris Paul because of the better offense. Talent level. Um, Chris Paul, he's just a better uh, shooter and um, mid range shooter. He, he's a better all around shooter than Jason Kidd, but for running the offense, I mean, Jason Kidd, he, he led the league in assists five times. Mm-hmm. He was also uh, all defensive NBA player. Uh, I think about nine times. I think I, I want to say nine times, but I'm not so sure. But I'm just saying this that he showed up in the playoffs. So that's the difference. He showed up in the playoffs all the time. Yeah. No. Yeah. And, I, I and yes. And, and 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 yes, they they do have that sort of. Uh, they do they do bring teams from from mediocre to good. You know, they, they do do that. And I'm not trying to discount that. I mean, although although Chris Paul last season uh, before the Suns, before he got to the Suns, um, the Suns, they were already um, a bubble playoff team. They were already doing well. They just added Chris Paul. So, you know, I can't really say that they were – really that bad last year. They, they, they were starting to begin to, to turn the page. So, now let's move on. Is Devin Booker the next Kobe? I saw Stephen A. say this, and I, I get it. Stephen A. is in the business of uh, producing hot takes and saying things that maybe he doesn't even believe in, but he says them for the purpose of uh, drumming up interest for his show. Uh, I go back to, I used to be a big wrestling fan. There was something that Chris Jericho said years ago when he was getting ready to fight Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania 19 because people were comparing him to Shawn Michaels. And the comparisons were warranted. Um, But he said, I was never trying to be, and granted, he was playing his character well. He was the bad guy in this feud, so he was playing the bad guy. But what he said, I felt was dead accurate for his career at the time and what he would go on to achieve in the future is I was never trying to be the next Shawn Michaels, because I was too busy trying to be the first Chris Jericho. And similarly speaking, Devin Booker can kind of say the same. He, I don't think he's ever, yeah, maybe. I think players of today that are at a high level draw some of their game from the legends of the past. So I'm sure that he's looked at tapes of Kobe or tapes of MJ or any other great player that you can think of and try to pick certain aspects of their game that he could apply to his own. But to call him the next Kobe Bryant, I don't think is fair to Kobe, even if Kobe was still alive. And I don't think it's fair to Devin because Devin Booker, to me, is the first Devin Booker, you know, and he's he's a he's a one of a kind shooting guard with tremendous offensive ability. And he's just trying to be the best version of himself and the first really the first kind of prototype of of that kind of a player the league has seen. And so to compare him to somebody that. Is Kobe the GOAT? Of course not, obviously not. But Kobe's definitely one of the greatest players of all time, one of the greatest shooting guards of all time with the legacy that is, even if, he, like I said, even if he hadn't died so young and so tragically, would, would still be one of the great legacies the sport has seen. You know, so to compare Devin Booker to that, when Devin Booker 
has not, I mean, how many league, how many years has Devin Booker been in the league? Five. He was taken in the 2016 draft. He's in his first NBA finals. He does have a great player guiding him like Kobe had Shaq guiding him. But the comparison to me is faulty because, I mean, sometimes we have to acknowledge that when a player is good or a player is great, like Booker is, they're just that. They're just great. It doesn't mean we compare them to a legend of the past and an all-time great from the past. We don't need to, to, to come. If a player becomes great as Booker has, we don't automatically need to compare that player to a legend. I think that's such a tired trope that you see in sports media. It's not surprising, but it gets lamer every time. Just let them be them. Just let them be them. Let the individuality shine through. And the more we get away from comparisons, the better it is. So, no, I don't think that Devin Booker is the next Kobe Bryant. That's no knock and no slap at Devin Booker. I think he would tell you he's not the next Kobe Bryant. Um, I think he's the first Devin Booker. Much like Kobe was the first Kobe. Yeah, I would agree with that, Uh, you know, 100%. I think that, you know, Yes, players, they emulate certain moves and things like that, but that does not mean they're necessarily be trying to be that player. Right. You know, I think that's a little bit too far-fetching. You know, Kobe, he's accomplished way too much in order for people to automatically compare a player to Kobe. Uh, I think that Devin Booker, he's a little bit too young to even be compared to Kobe. And I don't think that he could just, you know, automatically just get past D Wade. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like right. you, you can't you can't just rank him uh, uh, I, I understand the comparison, but you know you like you're you're acting like you're acting like D Wade and Clyde Drexler and a whole bunch of other players are chopped liver and shooting guard position. Right. You know what I'm saying? So I just I, I, I it's it's not you. It's not you. It's the media. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So so yeah, I, I would agree with that. He, he needs to be the first Devin Booker. And I feel like the coaching of Monty Williams and 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 also the, the help of Chris Paul setting him up and, and having him, you know, um, you know, putting him in the right positions to go to where he needs to be. I feel like this has definitely uh helped Devin Booker to be a better player. I do think that, you know, he definitely did take a step up last year. And he's even taking an even bigger step up in the playoffs. So uh, I don't think that he's the next Kobe. I do think that he's the first Evan Booker. So, so yeah. So let's move on. Are the Suns a fluke or were they for real? I think they would have had a great – I mean, we kind of talked about it earlier, so we don't have to spend too much time on this one. They did very well in the bubble. They did very well in the bubble, but people are going to say, well, that's the bubble. And I understand because there were certain guys that were balling out in the bubble that had no business balling out, as Jason Tatum kind of talked about. But nonetheless, I mean, they were 8-0 and in the bubble. And once you make the additions that they made, and obviously the biggest addition being CP3, I mean, I think a lot of people, again, as I said earlier, did a lot of people expect them necessarily to make the finals? I don't think people would have said that. A lot of people have them certainly being a very good team and being a lot better than they previously have been. So, no, I think that this, we could just – you know, breeze right through this one. I think they're for real. Yeah, I think they're for real. I think they're for real. I, I think they prove to me that they are contenders. Yeah. So, um, so, so, um, yeah, they, they got to where they were supposed to. Um, and they definitely showed that the mid range shot isn't dead. So, uh, so that, that's great. Definitely great. Now let's move on to the next question. Can Mikel Bridges be an all-star level player? I think he has the potential, and I kick myself as a Knicks fan because the Knicks, for years, that they've gotten a lot better at this now with the new regime. Obviously, Emmanuel quickly will be topping, have been good picks at this point, and you're excited to see what they can do going forward. Um, But the Knicks, a few years ago, when they had the previous regime that was awful, amongst many previous regimes that were awful, they drafted Kevin Knox, um, over Bridges, I believe. I don't. I, I think Bridges went went after Knox. I believe so. I don't think he went before. I think his brother might have went before. Miles might have went before Kevin Knox. Mike Mikel went after. And look at again. Obviously, it's a product of coaching. If Mikel was in New York with the coaching that the Knicks had at the time, would Mikel have uh, elevated his game to the level that he has now? Maybe not, because the coaching before Thibodeau was so bad. But of course. 
you know, hindsight is always 2020, as I said earlier. And look at what Kevin Knox is. Kevin Knox basically has one foot out the league. Kevin Knox certainly has one foot out in New York. I think if you dangled something as low as a seventh round uh, draft pick to the New York Knicks in exchange for Kevin Knox, they'd, they'd take the deal in a heartbeat because that's how much of, of, a, of a bust that he's been, unfortunately, to this point in his career. And look at where Mikhail is. And so, yeah, I think he can get to that level. And um, unfortunately, I would have loved to. I mean, could you imagine a team right now with Randall and Barrett in New York with well, you know, and quickly and top and bridges right in the mix. I mean, yeah, they're already an exciting team as it is, but they'd be even more exciting with a guy like that in the mix. So, yeah, you know, I, and every time I see him make a big shot or make a big play or have an exciting highlight reel dunk, I'll always kick myself as a Knicks fan because I'd be thinking to myself, if only he could be doing that in the garden. <laughs> the pain, Marvin, the pain. <laughs> I'm sorry, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, look, look, Kevin Knox, he still has a chance to be a good player. So, you know, no give up on him. Maybe, but for now, I'm in Spain, but the S is silent, my friend. Uh, so, so basically, uh, I, think that, I think that Mikel Bridges can definitely be an all-star level player. He's very consistent. And, you know, the, the more that he continues to play, the, and the more that he continues to improve on his game. I could definitely see him making the all-star team at a shooting guard level. Um, I also believe that teams are getting older and he could possibly make the all-star team in the next few years. So I could definitely see it happen, happening. I like Mikel Bridges and his, and his consistency. He's always uh, making shots and uh, sometimes he makes clutch three-pointers. So, you know, he's very, uh, very consistent. So let's move on to the Eastern Conference finals between the Bucks versus the Hawks. Let's start with our reactions. Uh, well, you know, I hated the fact that Giannis was went down. I'm glad he didn't tear anything. That's the most important thing. But I, I would have loved this to much like we talked about with the Clippers and the Suns. I would have loved this series to have been decided based strictly on the merits of two great players going head to head. And Trey, who unfortunately also got hurt, although he played in game six, um, you know, I would have loved it to have just been Trey going up against Giannis made a better man win because the first few games of the series were exciting. Trey Young goes on the road, takes game one in Milwaukee. Milwaukee comes right back and blows the doors off Atlanta in game two. That game three, Giannis plays the five, dominates at the five. The Bucks had no answer. After surviving, easily surviving the Knicks, let's face it, the Knicks have a lot of work to do. Their their, their big men leave a lot to be desired at the moment um, for, you know, uh, bless their hearts, bless their efforts. But nonetheless, you know, and obviously the Embiid was, you know, he played relatively well in the second round, but the Hawks were able to survive him. But they couldn't survive Giannis at the five. And then, of course, Giannis has that brutal injury with his leg and Trey steps on the stupid ref's foot and injures his foot. So I hate the injuries that kind of, to sap the series a little bit. But I thought it was a good series. I, I really thought, even though the Bucks talent-wise are better, I really thought this was anybody's series. Um, I wouldn't have minded either team winning, really. I think it would have been a great story either way. But I I um I think the better I think the better team did win here. I do think I'm very happy to see Chris Middleton get his due. Sometimes he gets slandered because of the money that he's making, and sometimes he doesn't have the best games. But he had some big games this series. Drew Holiday, after being awful in that game seven against Brooklyn, had a few big games, had a big bucket late in game six to clinch it, really. Um, P.J. Tucker, a guy I respect so much and would love to see in the Knicks. Uh, he had, he's had a great playoffs. I, I'm happy to see the Bucs uh, in the finals. I think the right team won. I believe the right team won. I also believe that uh, Trey Young, he definitely did show that he, that he's here to stay. Mm -hmm. I also believe that I believe that uh, Trey Young and the Atlanta Hawks and Nate McMillan, they all did their thing. I believe that. I just think that I just think that it was very exciting. I also believe that it definitely would have it could have gone to a game seven if if Trey Young was healthy. But I don't think the I don't believe that the that the Hawks would have won regardless. 
I don't think I don't believe that. Um, I don't think that the I don't think the Bucks were. I don't think that the series was on on on. I don't think that this series was on an equal playing field in terms of in terms of defense and also in terms of. Of, of, in terms of experience, because this is the first time the Hawks have ever been in the uh, conference finals. So, I also don't believe that the Hawks would have won this series regardless. But I do believe that it's very possible that Trey Young would have been able to, especially the seven. I also think that Trey Young he's extremely explosive, and he definitely loves playing that villain role, which is good for the team. Oh yeah, I mentioned I mentioned when, we were, when I was making the wrestling analogy earlier. I mentioned Chris Jericho. Chris Jericho is one of the great heels of all time, and it's the same thing with uh, Trey Young. Trey Young relished playing the heel. Uh, he did it against the Knicks, you know, and uh, he was a great heel in that series. He was a heel in Philadelphia for sure, and he relished that role. And he was a bit of a heel in this series, although obviously he got humbled in Game Six and got knocked out. But you know, I, if you're a Hawks fan. I mean, yeah, it's always sad to see the run come to an end and your team get eliminated. But listen, you have nothing to be ashamed of. You have nothing to hang your head about if you're a Hawks fan or obviously a Hawks player. Of course. When they were 14 and 20, people thought they were heading for the lottery. So for them to have come within two wins of an NBA Finals appearance, I mean, this this is a loss that really, I mean, it's going to bother you naturally if you're a sports fan, but it, it shouldn't really bother you to a major extent because, listen, this is just the beginning. The Hawks, the Hawks, not only is Trey Young here to stay, bro, the Hawks are here to stay. Yeah, I would say that they're definitely here to stay in the playoffs just until, until uh, you know, KD and Kyrie mm-hmm. Irving and James Harden retires and things right. like that. But I just yeah, don't really they, see them getting back to, to this it. position again. They have, they have to add. But I can definitely see them, you know, Right, yeah, but I can definitely see them sweeping the Sixers, though. So, <laughs> yeah, it's a different podcast for a different day. Oh boy, <laughs> definitely, definitely can sweep the Sixers for real. Yeah, as long as some next s- time. Uh, a certain six ten Australians playing point guard. Yeah, not even that, just the coach alone. Yeah, so, let's uh, let's move on to the next question. Um, the next question is. Where is it? Uh, oh, my fault. No worries. That was our reactions. That, that was our reactions to the series. So uh, now let's get into the questions. Mm-hmm. So will the Hawks be a threat in the next few years? Well, when you have, and I, I'm experiencing this as a Yankee fan right now, to use a baseball analogy now, the Yankees were, were in 2017, much like the Hawks this year, they weren't expected to do much. People had them not doing much of anything. The Yankees came within one win of the World Series. They got all the way to game seven of the ALCS. Um, and now, okay, you have this great run. It was unexpected. And people, like I said just now, this is, people know this is the beginning of something. Now you have to add the final pieces to put this team over the top. The Yankees have not done that. And now, finally, after a few playoff runs and a few deep playoff runs, um, they are now reaping what they have sown. The team is bad this year. They're unwatchable. They're barely above 500. They're pretty much heading towards a season of no playoffs. And that's because they have not properly built upon what they originally had in 2017. Bad trades, bad decisions, bad drafting um, has doomed them. And it's going to take a while to unwind that mess. Um, it's, it's not going to happen overnight. We'll have to see what happens with that. So similarly with the Hawks, you have to avoid falling into the same pitfall that the Yankees have fallen into where now that you've had this playoff run, great. What are you going to do to add to it? What are you going to do to ensure that you are here to stay? You have to draft. Well, you have to obviously make prudent moves in the free agent market. You have to obviously make prudent moves in the trade market because now the carrot's being dangled in front of you. Now you're in a position where everything looks good, like the Yankees were. But if you just bite at the first carrot, 
you might not like what you taste. So you have to be prudent and look for the, I um, mean, you know, this is a, a weird analogy, I know, but you have to look for the ripest one. You have to look for, basically what I'm getting at is what best fits you as a team. The front office has to look at what they have, look at what the holes are, and subsequently find the best solutions, both financially and talent-wise, for those holes. And as long as they do that, they'll be in the mix for the next few years. But obviously, they can't rest in their laurels. I mean, they have to they have to make sure they really see these decisions through. And hopefully for their sake and for every Atlanta sports fan's sake, and Lord knows they've suffered enough in recent years between the Falcons and the Braves, uh, uh, you know, hopefully they can make the right decisions. I believe that this team is automatically a second round team. So that's that's what I think. Yeah. But I do but I do not think unless they get the unless they get the 76ers again. But uh keep on making references to the Sixers, but well, we have to slip that slander and you know that, so right, right. But uh but 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 as for the next few years. I don't know. I mean, it just depends on who they get. And and as far as Nate McMillan, who has proven that he can definitely coach, I think that uh, I think that they could definitely be a threat in the next few years. I, I've seen them get to multiple multiple uh, conference finals or even a finals, depending on the explosion of Trey Young and the whole team in general. So I mean, they got good pieces around them already. So we'll just need to see what happens next year. So yeah, let's move on to let's move on to the next question. So the next question is: Is Trey Young a superstar? It's always a question that's asked with every single player that has achieved a certain modicum of success and has a certainly well above average talent level. Is he a superstar off this run alone? I'm going to say no, not because I'm a hater, but because I need to see him have a similar run again. Now, I'm not saying get to the conference finals, but if he comes out next year, balls out again, is an all-star again, and gets to at least a second round next year, um, and they, like I said just now, if they build upon this, um, then I'll say, yeah, I think he's a star. I think he's a borderline superstar. I don't think he's a superstar quite yet. I think a case could be made for borderline superstar, but I think it's a little bit too it's too early. Same thing for same thing for Luka Doncic. I think it's too early as well. Mm-hmm. I just think the people they're just projecting when it comes to those players, uh, especially off of first and second playoff runs. You know what I mean? So I just think that I just think that it's too too early and. If he gets to a second round next year, I still think that he's just a star in the league. But as far as superstar, there's only four superstars in the league. Four. Mm-hmm. Um, that's Steph, Kawhi, LeBron, and KD. That's it. Those are the four main superstars. As far as Giannis, he could solidify himself this year if he wins a championship. But to me, the fact that he even got to the finals this year, that solidifies him as a superstar. So I think that he's a superstar as well. Yes, so, sure. I, I, so those are the five. Those are the five superstars in this league. And you really can't really walk around it or things like that. So to me, my my criteria is you have to win. You, you have to either win a finals MVP. You have to be in the finals, play well in the finals, or you have to... Uh, Last one. You have to win MVPs. So, so those are the so those are my that's my criteria. And and to me, if you just judge it off that, then it's way easier for people to be able to discern whether or not if somebody's a superstar or not. Because right. you know, a player like Kyrie Irving, he could be called a superstar because of. Uh, because he went to a he went to a couple of finals, but but that does not make him a superstar because of who he was playing with. He was playing with LeBron James, but I believe that he's a borderline superstar. You know, so and and the thing is, is like if he if he like gets to another finals and he plays extremely well, things like that, and 
you know, and, and a lot of the onus is onus and the win winning is because of him, then you call him a superstar. But he's still on the team with KD. So it all depends on what Kevin Durant does. You know what I'm saying? So so that's just how I feel about superstar label in general. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I just think that it's easier for people to go by that criteria than it is just label label labeling labeling people a star after after a good playoff run or 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 having good stats throughout an entire series. Right. I think so, you yeah. don't you, you don't want to throw around that word too loosely. And that's what that's a habit a lot of people, particularly in the media, get into. They throw the word around way too loosely for my liking and many people's liking to where it's, you know, it's based off the moment. It's kind of flavor of the month type thing. And if you're going to say superstar, think about what that entails, man. I think I don't think anybody with reason should listen to what you just said in your description of a superstar and say that's unreasonable, because if you're going to put somebody up on that pedestal, that's what they have to have underneath their belt. Otherwise, they don't meet the criteria. You know, people get way too comfortable throwing that word around and forget what it truly means to be one. 